See who's harvesting vegetables for Anne Arundel County Public Schools next on Food for Thought. Hi, I'm Jody Rissi, the host for Food for Thought, and thanks for watching. Today I'm joined by Andy Holloway from Baywater Farms, and we're going to talk about fruits and vegetables in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Welcome, Andy, to Food for Thought. Thanks for having me. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself and Baywater Farms? Sure. Um, about myself, I'm a sixth generation family farmer. I've got three beautiful kids, 11, 8, and 5 years old. Um, we live right on the farm, so sometimes it can be pretty loud. Um, but they've adapted pretty well. In the summertime, my son helps in the pack house. Um, and in fact, this year I had him throwing watermelons with me. Wow. Um, some of the melons weighed almost as much as he did, so uh -huh. it didn't last too long. Then he became the count guy, because you have to count how many melons go into the bin. So, uh, so but it's fun. Good. That's like yeah. math, that's an extension of right? all of their schooling Absolutely. all in the yeah. summer. Yeah, yeah, and, um, and I pay them a um, little bit each week, and mm -hmm. uh, so they get to have their own spending money, which goes right out the window as soon right. as they hit Toys R Us. Right. So, but it's good. That's good. And I think, um, you know, we talked a little bit about it before the show that just, you know, I think your kids are, you know, they do what you do, right? I mean, they're right. role models of what we do. And right. having them be exposed to all that and understanding the value of work and right. of money and right. of all those things, it's really, I mean, I think maybe my two girls should come down and work on the farm. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> actually, uh, my son, Ben, uh, all of his classmates want to come work for do him. Do they really? He actually started hiring before I gave the okay. So that was a little bit of an issue. Yeah. Um, but it's almost like summer camp. But in a different way, they get paid to come to summer camp. There you yeah, go. Oh, so. You just probably have some transportation issues. Transportation and maybe labor laws I need to watch out for. Yeah. <laughs> <of course. laughs> but it's it's fun. Yep. Good. Yep. So, um, and then the farm. Mm -hmm. um, we're a sixth generation family farm mm -hmm. on the eastern shore of Maryland um, in the town of Salisbury. Um, we, uh, we're on the same property that my great, great, great grandfather um, cleared himself. He cleared it by hand. And in fact, uh, the, the office where we are now uh, was an old farmhouse and he built it himself. And this summer when we did our renovations, we were finding the rough cut timbers that he put in uh, himself. So really, yeah, there's a lot of history on the farm. Um, wow. that, far that farmhouse was built in 1904. And before that, there was a different one that didn't survive. So, and I know we've been on the farm, we've mm -hmm. done multiple visits. So is that, um, so there's, there's the old farmhouse, I guess, right on the property across from the greenhouse. That's right? the one. Okay. Yep. That it was built in, I want to say 1904. Wow. Um, by, by Randolph, my great, great grandfather. Yep. Wow. Yep. And then I grew up in that house. And so the company was started uh, up in my bedroom, actually. You know, Apple was founded in a garage. We were founded in a bedroom. So that's what I always joke about. That is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then how about the greenhouses? So um, I know we're going to talk about a sure. typical day of farming, but I think on the farm there's multiple things that um, we realize when we go. So you have mm -hmm. field crops, but you also have greenhouses. Yeah, uh, the biggest greenhouse is a hydroponic greenhouse. It's called NFT, Nutrient Film Technique. Um, and that's basically, it almost looks like the gutters on your house. Mm -hmm. um, and underneath, inside the gutter, the water trickles down. And it's not just water, it's a nutrient. Um, so that's why they call it nutrient film technique. And just the roots of the plant dangle in the water because that's all you really need to water and, and uh, feed. And it takes up all the nutrients and it grows. And when the conditions outside are optimal, we can get um, from seed to harvest in four to five weeks. Wow. Um, it's funny though, because it changes as the seasons change. So when the sun sets earlier and, and, you know, and we start getting darker earlier, they slow down quite a bit. So it can hmm. take up to eight weeks. So. And I think in the greenhouse too, there's, um, at the end of the greenhouses, I guess that's the, is that like the air conditioning it system sure is. of the greenhouse? Yeah, yeah, it's actually, we call it, um, old school air conditioning mm -hmm. and, um, it's called a wet wall. And so basically the water just trickles down, um, over cardboard and then the air fans pull all of that moisture in. And we can lower the temperature inside that greenhouse by 10 to 15 degrees doing that. And then another 10 to 15 degrees by putting a shade cloth up top. Wow. How many, and, and I don't know, maybe this is case, a crazy question to ask, sure. but how many plants could go in there? Because there was even double tiered, right? Right. That's something we started doing because we are currently growing on a linear surface. Um, so we started stacking on top and using LED lights. And um, yeah, that's been, um, 
uh, learning experience. We haven't quite figured it out quite yet. Um, and don't quote me on this. I want to say we've got over 36,000 holes inside there. Wow. And so it's a whole floor plant. So uh -huh. every hole has a plant in it. And um, that's where it grows. Yeah, I just remember seeing even the trays. So there was those trays with the... Um, yeah, the uh, start? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we start in something called rock wool. There you and go. And it's spun volcanic ash. Um, and it has a zero pH and that's where the seed goes in and you keep that watered and the, um, the seed starts to grow and when it's about that tall, um, two to three inches, that's when it breaks apart from the rock wool and you transplant it into the gutter. Mm -hmm. and so they're all there. pulled apart by hand? They are. They're yeah. seeded by hand too. Are they really? Um, we have something, we have a spring mix. Um, that's our second best seller behind Bib. And the spring mix is seeded by hand, five different varieties and we use something very technical called a number two pencil. Uh, we sharpen the tip and we kind of roll that around in the seed mixture and put it right in there. We Are found you that to, serious? Yeah. So it has all different seeds on the tip? Yep. And we do it by hand. That's the only way to do it. Yep. Wow. And so we we used everything under the sun. We used wires, we used brushes, anything to try to figure out what was best and it was a number two pencil. Huh. So <laughs> it has to go down a little bit then. So it's actually, does it penetrate into that uh, volcanic? Uh, no, it sort of. It kind of just sits on top. It sort of sits on top. There's a little divot there mm -hmm. and that's where the seed sort of sits um, wow. while, it, while it germinates until it gets to, you know, a certain size and then we transplant it. Yep. Well, that's pretty cool. And um, we buy your bib. So we yes. know your bib is awesome. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, yep. It is the best bib going. <laughs> um, we have been buying it, I think, it could be going on two years that we bought bibs. I so. would say we've been working yeah. together for quite a while. Yeah, and that's that's the number one seller. It's a great, It's we always say it's bulletproof, yeah. um, meaning that it can take a lot of abuse. And, you know, you say, you say abuse and that sounds weird when you're talking about produce, but inside that greenhouse, those are the most pampered plants that you could ask for. When you're outside in the elements, you've got uh, wind and you've got rain and you've got everything else under the sun. In that greenhouse, those things are, you know, all the plants inside there are basically coddled until they're ready to harvest. And I know we're gonna talk about outside, but let's go back to the bib. Um, I loved when we were in the greenhouse. So the bib comes out and then um, your staff, they mm -hmm. pull them out, but they go in that little tray. So the little tray um, keeps the root Ball. Yeah, I guess it's uh, is it still called a root ball? Yeah, I don't know. it is. Yeah, it it's the root. Yeah. Okay. So when we harvest, the roots come out with the plant. Um, uh -huh. That's unlike uh, harvesting in the field. In the field, you usually cut at the base of the plant, and you know, but that decreases your shelf life. Um, so it's a whole different method of harvesting, growing, and everything else. So this gets harvested, and you'll see roots. My my kids call them angel hairs. Um, you'll see these roots that'll hang off the plant like this. So if the if the head of the bib is right here, you've got all these roots and that actually can keep the plant alive in your refrigerator and your walk-in um, for up to two weeks um, because those roots don't know any better. You're starting to cool the conditions down and the roots are still keeping the plant alive. So we've had these, you know, stories from customers and uh, farmers, people at farmers markets that they were able to keep their lettuce alive for, you know, up to two, two weeks. weeks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I know when we first did it as um, we did a tasting of the rainbow with mm -hmm. the bib lettuce, and then we actually put it on during our, you know, Maryland homegrown school lunch week. Right, right. Um, I would love to be able to figure out how to do lettuce wraps with it. So. I know. Yeah, that takes a really big bib. Yeah. Um, that's part of it. And we do have some chefs that, um, that we specifically grow for, but that takes a lot longer for us. You know, a lot of times in that greenhouse, we're trying to turn and burn. Um, mm -hmm. The more times you can pop out and back into that hole, um, the, the better it's going to be for, you know, for our farm to, right. to keep going. So we do let some get big, but you also have an overcrowding um, problem that you can run into because your holes on the gutter are eight inches apart all the way down the gutter. Um, so if the head gets too big, they start pushing into each other and then it can deform them a mm -hmm. little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and we always keep thinking um, on labor side of it on our end. So what do we do? We get this beautiful head of bib lettuce mm -hmm. and then we're going to put, you know, be it, you know, um, I guess a, a chicken or a sure. beef or whatever we're going to put in there, but I can't even imagine when we're doing 33,000 meals, how are we oh. going to wrap all these little Yeah, little I'm not sure. You're going to need a team to yeah. do that. Yeah, that's, so, that's a lot. <laughs> um, I still love it. We're going to still keep buying the bib. I think at this point, I'm like, oh, lettuce wraps might not happen in the right. near future. Um, we definitely are thinking about them, cool. but might awesome. not be in the near future. That's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about the field crops. Sure. So we were also um, able to, you know, again, visiting you numerous times. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Sure. But um, you really... Uh, showcased your field crop and the growing of one of our favorite vegetables. Which one is that? Butternut squash. Butternut. <laughs> yeah, the butternut is, um, 
that's a finicky plant right there. Uh, so yeah, we grew more this year than we ever have before. Um, it's a really unique um, item uh, in that it's got a shelf life. Everything else we grow, we don't really have much of a, what they call a shelf life, meaning how long it, it can stay around until it goes bad. Uh, butternut, if it's done properly and it's cured properly, can last for months. Um, so we, we've really been trying to grow that more and more. Um, so we went pretty big. We did, I want to say 20, almost 30 acres of butternut this year. Wow. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's a beautiful plant, but it's a lot of learning. Um, yeah, and I think the curing, that's something that, you know, as a dietitian, as mm -hmm. a mom, I'm like curing. What the heck is curing? Right. So what? Right, so it's curing in a, yeah, for it, a viewer. Sure. Um, so what happens is uh, once you harvest the actual butternut, um, it goes into a process in, a, I, I believe it's 70% humidity, um, 70 to 80 degrees for a period of two weeks, maybe more. Um, and what happens is the, the enzymes inside start to break down and it actually softens up the fruit, but it hardens the outer shell. Um, and that's when the butternut tastes the way it should, should taste. You don't want to go pick a butternut and eat it right away. It's hmm. going to be more bland um, and it's, the shelf life is not going to be there. Is the, um, is the skin going to be soft? You know, the outer skin. Yeah. So if you no. pick it in the field, is it at it's all? A little, yes, it is. Okay. It is softer. Um, so you got to be gentle. Then mm -hmm. you, we lay it out. Uh, sometimes we lay it out inside some of our supplementar, supplemental uh, greenhouses in the back. Mm -hmm. And that's where the curing process starts. Yeah, yeah. See, and I had no idea that. I mean, I love it as a vegetable. Right. I think our students in Anne Arundel County love it. Right. But to think it goes through all those steps, because we saw all those little mm -hmm. plants getting put in and it yep. was amazing. It was a lot. Yeah. And it. It's really funny because uh, being a sixth generation farmer, um, I know a lot about farming, but I don't know everything. And so that was a learning curve for us. In fact, um, the first year we grew it, we, um, we picked them too early. There's a little vein on the stem that connects the butternut uh -huh. and it's green. And then it has to turn uh, brown and that's when you can harvest it. If you cut it while it's green, it's still taking in nutrients and still developing. So those are little things that huh. I didn't know about. But How'd you figure that out? So you cut them and they were probably uh, We green. got a complaint from a customer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were it starting to send, no, no, no. <laughs> no, we, we had just started harvesting and we were very small at that point. Uh -huh. and, um, and they said, hey, you really, I think you cut this too early. And so we started doing some more research. But talking about research, it's funny because when we renovated the farmhouse, upstairs I found my great grandfather's farming notes and he took meticulous notes from 19, I think 32 all the way until 46. And so it's what he planted, how much fertilizer he used, um, oh you know, the market price when he finally harvested, what the yields were and things like that. Um, funny enough, I couldn't find butternut in that book though. Oh, darn. <laughs> so yeah. was he growing anything different than you were? I mean, I'm sure he is because times have changed. Yeah. But what was his primary crop? So he grew a lot of um, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. He grew, um, I want to say lima beans, definitely big into sweet potatoes, which we're trying this year. Um, you know, what we typically do on the farm is we get an idea and we say, hey, this might be really good for us to grow. Um, then the research starts, then the, you know, procuring the seeds starts and, and it's a big process. It can take a year to get an, what started as an idea into the ground and finally harvested. I mean, yeah. it's a big undertaking. And then you find these little things like cutting the, the butternut at the right time. At the end of that cycle, that's pretty frustrating. But, you know, there's a lot of good research out there. We work with Maryland Department of Ag. They have a, a guidebook and, and tells you a lot of good things about storing, handling, harvesting. Um, so, yeah, we're still working and we're always looking for new things. Good. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a it's a class operation. I mean, we Thank love you. the visits Thank you. Um, and we love the videos <laughs> and we love the produce. Great. <laughs> um, so I really think um, the best thing that could have happened for Anne Arundel County Public School students is our partnership and sure. that we're able to buy from you. So absolutely. Um, we're going to take a quick break, but that was tons about farming. <laughs> and then I think we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the things we do with marketing. Sure. And what else we provide for our students Sounds here in great. Anne Arundel County. As you can see, Baywater Farms is truly a partner with Anne Arundel County Public Schools. In the history of the farm, the farm and the, the ability to operate the way it does is just priceless for all of our students and for all of us in food and nutrition services. So don't go away. We're going to be right back with Baywater Farms, and we're going to talk about more initiatives with Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Today I come to you with exciting news about school meals. School meals offer students a healthy school breakfast and lunch. Every day, students are offered unlimited choices of fresh fruits and vegetables. Students are encouraged to select up to two cups of fresh produce each day at lunch from our unique salad bars. You may also monitor your child's school meals online at My Payments Plus. 
This is a convenient tool we offer to all parents to make managing your school meal accounts a simple process. To learn more about My Payments Plus, simply visit www.mypaymentsplus.com or call 877-237-0946. Each year, families have the ability to apply for free or reduced price meals. The application to apply is online. Parents, you may log on to applyformeals.aacps.org. The process is fast, easy, convenient, and it's accessible from any computer. Remember, if you received meal benefits last year, you must complete a new application each school year. Thank you for this opportunity to provide you this valuable information pertaining to school meals. School meals fuel your child's brain and body for academic excellence. If you have any questions regarding the healthy school meals offered, please contact me at 410-222-5900. Welcome back and thanks for staying tuned to Food for Thought. Andy Holloway from Baywater Farms is with me and we're talking tons about farming and tons about Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Andy, we talk so much about um, farming and all the different products, but the favorite thing that I saw on the farm the last visit was your heirloom cherry tomatoes. And I'm assuming right. they're cherry, right? I'm gonna say they cherry are. or grape. Yep, yep. Um, share with everybody, um, they're multicolor. Mm -hmm. um, they don't all grow on the same right. plant. Right. And I don't know how many plants you had in that one area we're in, but it was absolutely stunning. The product was beautiful. Yeah. We use it all the time. Oh, that's great. Uh, so that has become our number one in the field. Uh, it did not start that way, but it ended that way. Uh, so we have been developing the color mix on those cherries for, I think, four years now. And wow. we call it our Maryland mix because it's got a little bit of the red wow, and the yellow and the purplish, purplish yeah. blackish. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really neat. Um, we, uh, Tim that works with me and, and myself, we fought each other a little bit on how to plant those because what we did in the first year was we did one block of red, one block of yellow, white, purple on down the line. Uh, that turned into an issue because in the pack house, we want to make every Clam shell is a mixture of colors. So then we're in the pack house, we got the reds and the purples, but no whites. Or we got the yellows and the purples, but no reds. Uh, so what we started doing was making this mixture. And so what you saw was a line of rainbows. Basically, we've taken all of the seeds, and it's a weird thing, but every, every February when we start our process, we dump all the seeds into a big container. And you probably were looking at I would say close to 30,000 cherry tomato plants out there in the was field. Was it really? Wow. I mean, it, it was, was a lot. Yeah. But that's really a lot. Yeah, yeah. and it's become a great seller. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, this summer, we had our best year on cherry tomatoes, and we plan to expand even more uh, because we, were, we still weren't meeting demand. People love it. And the whole reason, again, it comes back to family and the kids, the whole reason we started growing the cherry tomatoes, we started with some big beef steaks, very difficult to grow. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But my kids, every time I'm in the grocery store, they want the cherry tomatoes and they just <laughs> pop them in. And, you know, for kids that would typically eat cookies or, you know, Cheez-Its or whatever, to see them eating those cherry tomatoes, I thought, all right, we need to develop this some more. Mm -hmm. um, so we started with just a few hundred cherry tomatoes the first year and we sold out and they grew like wildfire. And uh, so we knew that that was going to be a good growth strategy. And the best part is we can put marketing on it. A beefsteak, a zucchini, a squash, an eggplant, you can't put much marketing on that. But when you have a clamshell, um, even though it is plastic, which nobody loves, um, we do try to recycle anything we don't use. But you can put history of the farm on there, your logo mm -hmm. on there, um, and anything else that you can reach out to the customer and tell them who you are mm -hmm. and tell them that you're a Maryland farm, that you're you know local to the area and you're supporting a local family farm. Yeah. yeah. I absolutely love that you call it, so you do call it a Maryland mix? We do like, call it a Maryland mix. Next year, yeah. well, even this year, yeah. I'm going to market it. Every time we buy them, I know we just yeah. recently had them in... Um, again, we'll buy them as often as you have them, but I know it's a field crop, so sure. yeah. it's going to be limited. But yeah. Um, what a great marketing tool. And That's for great. us to do it with our students, because we've used them for Tasting of the Rainbow. We right. used them on that Maryland homegrown um, school lunch week. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the colors are beautiful. And, you know, I never put that together. So yeah. that's an awesome marketing strategy yeah. for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, to be able to say to the kids, hey, it's Maryland colors. Absolutely. Like, yeah, way? we're Maryland proud. And, you know, we've got the uh, trim of the logo um, uh -huh. is Maryland on, the, on all the packaging for the bib and all the packaging for the cherries. Um, you know, so we, we try to make sure everybody knows where we're from, um, you know, because sometimes 
Maryland flags have become very popular. Um, you see them on bumper stickers. I was looking at tons on the way here today. Yeah. And so people can associate that. And so that's one of the first visual things that they can see and they go, oh, well, it must be local because why else would they put a Maryland flag on it? Right. You know? So. I love when we, um, so we often are tweeting back and forth, right? right so absolutely. Um, we take advantage of each other's tweets. And sure. I love to be able to promote that I bought from your farm. And right. I love that you kind of retweet it or kind of post it. Yeah. I love when you take pictures in the greenhouse or in the right. field. Um, but some of my favorite tweets are when I tweet like either the whole, um, and I, I don't remember how many clamshells come in a case, but like mm. when I get the whole case, because it's all lined up and it all says yeah. Baywater Farms yeah. and the colors popping through the clear plastic. Yeah. And yep. So some of those are my favorite. And then I love when our staff, which we have the best staff in the world, but when they dump all those tomatoes in a bowl yep. and it's in a black bowl, it just pops with color and they're washing them and they're getting them ready for the service for the students. Absolutely. It, yep. looks, it yeah. looks great. It's my, my kids' favorite time of year is... Um, right around middle of June when the cherries start coming on and day after day, we're out there scouting the field, uh, making sure the bees are doing their work. Uh, you know, bees are a big part of what we do, making sure everything gets pollinated. And so the kids and I check on them and I give 10 bucks to the first kid that finds the first cherry tomato of the year. And, uh, oh, well, you know. you've got those kids going well. I do, I do, yeah. yeah. Good for you. <laughs> so, you know, let's go to, back to pollination because I sure. didn't think we we're going to talk about pollination today, but it's pretty cool because I get yeah. to see it on the farm and right. I got to see it in the greenhouses. Right. Um, you know, not yours, but I, another greenhouse. So the, the bees do all the work for you, correct? Yeah, whenever I do field trips at the farm, I always joke and I say, this is the hardest workers out here. Mm -hmm. um, I also make sure no employees are standing around because <laughs> I don't want to hurt their feelings. But but yeah, that's, uh, you know, it goes without saying, if those bees don't do their job and, you know, there's the um, colony collapse disorder that's going on. And, uh, you know, that's a scary thing to think about um, what could happen to, uh, to the bees because uh, no tomato is going to be grown unless that it gets pollinated from those bees. And... Uh, so you look out across the field, like you saw how big it was, mm -hmm. to think that they've got to touch every single blossom uh, to make a to make a new cherry tomato. That that's kind of daunting. I couldn't imagine. So, um, you know, a neat thing happened this year though. Uh, I was turning the irrigation system on, and I got it out of my truck, and there were tons of bees, and it, we didn't have a hive there. Uh, we didn't put a hive for pollination. It turns out it was a wild colony, and so I called my beekeeper. He came over within an hour and put a a uh, beehive out there and was able to get them all inside really? and now they're working for him now yeah huh. they were sort of nomads um i got a little scared that they were you know africanized or you know yeah. some, so, something um uh so when you that, put the hive there they just uh how do they know to navigate in there so i don't know there enough about trick. it yeah, yeah yeah i don't know enough i believe he put a pheromone inside that uh -huh. lured the queen bee into it and then all the worker bees followed the queen bee, and then it went into the hive. Then it comes back at nighttime, picks it up, and you know they start wow. working for them. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's and amazing. Then, oh, those bees—they've got the best life. I mean, they work hard, but then all winter he ships them down to Florida, and they just hang out in Florida all winter. Nice. Takes them down. Maybe. Yeah. Well Maybe we should hook up on that train. And be able to go down for a few <laughs> exactly. Our kids might like it too. Right? Exactly. <laughs> um, how long do the cherry tomatoes grow? So you said right. June. I. I guess I'm surprised that they start that soon. I know we have purchased right. them in June. Mm -hmm. We also purchase them in September when we come back. Yeah, so, so that's that's a great point. Uh, these cherry tomatoes are heirloom variety. Uh, heirloom means that they are indeterminate growth. Indeterminate growth can grow um, all the way until frost kills them, basically. If you treat them right, if you give them the right nutrients, the right soil, um, they will continue. So we are still pulling cherry tomatoes out of the field right now, and it's you know, getting into in the fall, fall. you're, yeah, yeah. We're, we're still pulling in the fall. Um, so it's pretty good, um, to stagger your planning. So we want to be first in the market. We want to be early. Um, that can come back and bite you, um, uh, because we try every year we're planning earlier and earlier, mm -hmm. but we would never plant the whole crop. So we'll do 10,000 now, another 10,000 later, 5,000, we call it a kicker patch, 5,000, and continue on that way so that the, the season has this arch to it. And when you're hitting mid-July and into mid-August, you've got the most volume coming out of the field. So the first plants are you know, still harvesting, but the middle's going strong. That's and right. Okay. And then the next patch is coming on too, so you've got the end of the first patch and the beginning of the last patches mm -hmm. coming in with the biggest bulk of your stuff. Wow. And I can tell you that the farming has boiled down to... Um, spreadsheets 
unfortunately. I mean, that's what it takes because when you think about trying to manage that many plants, that many transplants, the dates and what mm -hmm. they've had on them and all of those things and, and when you expect harvest, you have to be scientific almost. Right. You have to use... And did you have your... Um, I can't remember. I thought the lines were marked. Didn't you have something marked on them? Or, I know you guys were working on the water. You were working in the water oh, system yeah, yeah, when yeah. we were there. Yeah. And we also had... I think there, when you were there, we had just had a blowdown. Uh -huh. So we had this big thunderstorm come through. So all the cherry tomatoes, because they're indeterminate, what happens is they grow straight up and they keep growing. So you have to keep trellising them and they're on uh, Honduras pine stakes that are... Uh, I think it's two by two. Um, and we pound them into the ground manually every year. Um, mm -hmm. Then we reuse the stakes. Well, what happened was a big thunderstorm came through and it broke the stakes and they all fell down. So then we had to get trucks and forklifts and stand it back up. So the, you can imagine the plants are attached to these trellises and they all fell down. And then we had to basically- You have to probably do them all at the same time. Yep. So it was me and all my guys on a Sunday afternoon and it was 102 degrees outside and we we're standing them back up, pounding them back in the ground. It was crazy. But guess what? The plants survived. Not a single problem with them. Wow. They're pretty hardy. Once mm -hmm. you once you treat them well and you give them good food and nutrients, yeah. It's and I cool. remember the day we were on the farm, wasn't it? It had to be a hundred. It, oh, it was so hot. Yeah, it gets hotter and hotter every year. That's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> it was so hot. I was like, oh my gosh, I think I I'm dressed wrong. It was so hot. Um, yeah, it, it's brutal out there. And and not only that, but you've got these trellises, uh, these lines of trellises where the the tomatoes are, and because they're indeterminate, sometimes they can be ten feet high. Well, that means there's no breeze coming through. So you've got three foot space between the tomatoes. The guys are walking through all day and there is no wind blowing. I mean, it, it's it's pretty bad conditions. Yeah, and I yeah. think I remember, um, you know, your staff pulling, right? So they were pulling from all those different in the right. um, crate. I don't even know. Yeah, is it called a crate at the we end? We it a black flat. Yeah. Right. It was absolutely stunning because yeah. all the colors are truly mixed, just like yep. you wanted. Exactly. Perfect combination. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm, I was quite impressed. Like I we said, every time I go, yeah. I just learn more and more. And, yeah. you know, I keep thinking maybe farming should be in my history. You know? <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about we talk a little bit about arugula? Sure. Um, we also bought arugula and that's mm -hmm. going back to the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, so much of that stuff. And I, I think it's pretty cool. I could call you and say, we're looking for another tasting of the rainbow, which everybody knows first Friday in all schools in Anne Arundel right. County, um, public schools. We offer a new fruit or vegetable. Mm -hmm. We did tons of your local last year, right. um, tons of those greens. So like an arugula is a, you know, a unique crop to us, to school right. meals. Um, you sell that pretty uh, widely? Yeah, we do. Um, it's a tough one to keep in stock, to be honest. Um, when you guys tell us that you want some, it takes a little bit of planning um, to make sure that we've got it in the right, um, in the right areas of the greenhouse and make sure we've got the right quantities. Uh, but I got to say, it's got some of the most unique flavor. And I'm curious what the students thought of the taste. Yeah, the, I think some of them. Um, some like it and some don't. Some didn't. That's yeah. basically, we always hear the same thing. Mm -hmm. People either love it or they hate it. And anybody that doesn't know, the, the arugula has got just the most peppery flavor, spicy, almost like an herb, uh -huh. uh, more than a lettuce. You know, and I think it must be a cross somewhere between there. Um, it's great mixed with things straight by itself. It can be a little daunting. Yeah, see, and it, we did it straight by itself because we did try you? to say to the students, you know, even when we do radishes, like sure. we did watermelon radishes, right, right. and we do, um, we did the radish shoots. Yes, from yes, you exactly. Um, it's kind of interesting because we want to say, you know, taste it in its simplest form, mm -hmm. right? With no, right. I mean, we do roast tons of things, sure. but we right. just want them to taste it and really right. accept it for what it tastes like. That's but right. yeah. it was a little bit. Some of the students were like, Ooh, <laughs> I'm not sure about this one. So I think. Yeah. Peppery, um, yeah. more of a bitter, I guess, right? right? So um, that's always interesting on the field trips that students take on the farm, too, um, is the peppery taste of the arugula. Um, I always get them to try that. And then the second thing is shishito peppers. Uh, we grow a lot of Japanese shishito peppers, um, but they're also called the Russian roulette of peppers because one in 10 is spicy. So I give them out and I'll take 10 and give them the 10 students and they all take a bite simultaneously and you see who's got a hot one. And uh, yeah, Yikes. that's always Who gets pretty the hot fun. One? Uh, inevitably, it's always a girl, oh, um, no. a little girl, and she's always not very happy about yeah. it. <laughs> that is, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're kind of coming to a close. Okay. We could probably talk for an hour, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your partnership. Sure. Thank you for growing in Maryland. And thank you for selling to Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you.
As you can see, Baywater Farms is so key to all of the local produce that we provide the students in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. They've participated with Tasting of the Rainbow, we've done videos on site, we've done field trips um, for our staff as well as Design and Print Services, and our students really get the benefit each and every day to have a healthy school lunch with local produce from Baywater Farms. So for that, I thank Andy, I thank everything that he does on the farm, and it really helps our students have nutritious meals being ready and fueled for success. If you have any questions about the School Meals Program, please call me at 410-222-5900. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time on Food for Thought.